Welcome to the Canadian winter in November, you, by the way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you brought it with it's, warm- it's It certainly was that way in St. Louis as well. And, oh, my God. And it's uh, Chicago shut down. Oh, my God. A thousand flights. You need a good winter coat. You got a good winter coat with you? I have a coat for uh, minus 20. Oh, yeah. You're grand. Yeah, yeah. No, you're fine. It's one of those little crush-up ones, but... They say it's minus 20. I'll let you know that if uh, if that works or be- not. It better not go minus 21 or yeah, you're yeah, in trouble. Yeah, baby, baby. Can we talk about this? Uh, we just heard the children in art, the Stephen Sondheim tune, um, title track from the new record. Um, and it's a compilation of songs from your diary series, like a, yeah. a collection that I've been familiar with for a while. You know, what was, what was the, what were you looking for when you put all these songs sort of together that you well, chose? <laughs> where's the cough button? Is there a cough yeah, button? Yeah, there's a cough button there. Good, it works. I made, it made me cough. Um, so uh, what, what happened was uh, I, uh, my piano player, Paul Ford, retired after 30-some years. So and then my homeland schedule got kind of intense, and uh, so I backed off a little. Then I missed the music, and I didn't know what to do. So my dear friend, Bob Hurwitz, who started None Such Records, says, I want you to meet somebody. And right. he introduces me to Thomas Bartlett. Dove man. Dove man, mm-hmm. and he's the best, and he's amazing. And I go over, and Thomas and I hit it off, and then uh, he doesn't know a single Broadway show tune. He never heard of them, and he's just a singer-songwriter guy, and uh, they all come to him, you know. And so, um, uh, he bottom line is, on Christmas Eve 2017, he sends me 300 songs to listen to on various platforms, which, as you've just learned from my computer skills, are minimal. But I figured out how to open up these platforms. And I and on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, I listened to all 300. And I chose about 26 or 28. I can't remember. And then we, we went in the studio right after Christmas, and we started recording uh, all through 2018. And I said, before we even started, I said, you know, I'd love to make a diary. I'd love to just make a, you know, hit the button whenever we're working, talking, working, whatever. And I'd like to record one, and, and instead of trying to be the perfect thing or figure out the concept of this or, or any, anything like that, it's just what's going on right now, this moment, this day, here, now, you, me. And if we have 10 or 11 or 12, we'll put it out digitally. So we create a series called Diaries, None Such, Let Us Put It Out. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody found it, you know, yeah. because they, they don't have anybody <laughs> else doing this. And so it probably was a young tree falling in the forest. Right. And, um, and, uh, so then Bob said to me, after we'd done three of them, one called January 27, 2018, April, May 2018, and then the last one, um, uh, December 2018, he said, I think we got a record here. And we, uh, Thomas and Bob and I all pow out and put this order together, and I added something else, and and then we... We had the first record that I've released in 17 years. So what were you like, see, given how this is just a snapshot, each of these records were just kind of a snapshot of where you were in your life, you know, yeah. or just what you were doing at the time. Right. Then when you, when it's time to cull them, or, or should I say, not call the opposite of cull them, take them and, and put them together, what were you looking for then? You know, was it, the well, be, was it the best of, the stuff that meant the most to you? No, 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 no. I listened to, you know, Bob said to me years ago, he said, you're lyric driven. I said, yeah, story driven, lyric driven, the words. Yeah. And uh, I've never found the music didn't equal the words. And so I just was looking for stuff that uh, I connected to. And this was a whole variety of things I connected to. And then I started pulling out stuff I'd written 40 years ago myself. And I'm not, I'm no great songwriter, but I had fun. And my kids said, dad, just write. Thomas encouraged me. And so then we wrote a few things that are on these diaries. Actually, the one that's on, on children and art is a a song called um, uh, Raggedy Ann that I wrote uh, 40 some years ago. But I don't do that in the concert. I do a different one in the concert called Buckingham. Buckingham. Uh, that is on the diary series. And um, I've just been having fun, and it's given me the courage to go back to writing. And But I love these songs. They, they are songs that talk to me right now at this moment. It's not some retrospective of my life, no. you know, from, you know, many years ago. It's what's talking to me right now at... You know me right now in this world, this moment, this time. Well, it's just nice to hear you. It. Nice to hear you singing again. I mean, I've just—it's so great to be singing Cause again. Because you started singing me. when you were a kid, or you were in choirs when you were seven or something. Yeah, right? yeah, seven years old. I joined the boys' choir at Congregation Row Fayette, the South Side of Chicago. Mrs. Goldberg was the cantor's wife, and and she put me as a soloist uh, in the boys' choir on Saturday Shabbos morning, and. I had a great time, and then I did it till I was 14 or 15, after my, like a year or two after my bar mitzvah, and, and it defined my life. I heard all those old men praying and crying in their voice when they sang, and, and that's sort of where I learned 
the feeling. Well, that that music can be more than just a song. It can be meaningful. It can have a spiritual meaning. It can yeah, do, it it can do mis- something to you. It had a mystery to right. it because I would listen to these men who were, I say old men, that were younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time, <laughs> but I would right? listen yeah, to yeah. them pray and sing these beautiful melodies, which are in my bones. And there was a cry in their voice, and there was a mystery to that cry. And I, I, and, and they would get lost in it, and they'd close their eyes. And, and it just was sort of magical. And, and I, I just didn't even pay attention, but it, it, I, it just became a part of me, I realized, later on in life. Did you start to understand? Was there a moment where you started to hear music and you started to go, oh, now I know what they were hearing. Now I know what they were feeling. I do. I do, because... I think whether it's funny, sad, meaningful, connective, they're all like little remembrances or prayers to me or recollections. You know, one of my favorite lines in all of literature is from a musical that Oscar Hammerstein wrote. And it's a it's a line that's in a lot of cultures. As long as there's one person on earth who remembers you, it isn't over. And a lot of these songs make me remember a lot of things. Others make me wish for other things. Others make me celebrate a lot of things. But I guess more than anything, it, 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 they're, they're about finding the light for me. Um, some of them are very ironical, and, and, and it's easy to you know, go down the dark road with some of these songs, but I, I, I looked at it one day and I went, no, 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 and I hit the light switch. And I just flicked that switch and I went, make all of them the opposite of that. No matter how much they're dragging you down that rabbit hole, force your way out. Bruce Coburn said, kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight. Yeah, there you go. That's pretty good, hey? Yeah. Speaking of songs, meaning uh, remembrances, can can we play the first song we have here? She had her moments. She had some stars. Can you say that line again? Kick the at the show you got to kick at the darkness the till it bleeds daylight. Outside the Casa Rosada, crying Ava Pero. I can also quote but Leonard Cohen. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Pretty good, hey? Yeah. Also, what are we listening to right now, Mandy? Oh, I wasn't listening. <laughs> I was talking to you. It's, uh, oh, what a circus, oh, what a circus, Vida. You! 1979. So in the spirit of songs giving you memories and, and being like prayers or being like meditations, that's you as Che Guevara. What's it like hearing that? What, what sort of thoughts come to mind? Oh, my Lord. It was, I, I remember we were at 20th Century Fox Studios where we recorded it. Um, I remember eating in the commissary with Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. I remember my wife, who was my fiance that I just met. And... Um, and I remember that I was uh, 25 years old, and it was a fun thing to do that day. And uh, it was uh, many lifetimes ago. And a life-changing one. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I said this to someone the other day. How often do you get to hear the moment your life changed? How often do you get to... How many people have that privilege, you know? Yeah, it's funny. I would never think of that as the moment that my life changed. Although it certainly was the moment that brought me out to... A larger audience, yeah. but the moments for me where my life changed was when I met my wife, Catherine right. Grody, felt forty years ago, April sixteenth, first date, nineteen seventy eight, and and when I saw my first son Isaac, you know, well, I saw him first mm-hmm. when he came into this world, and mm-hmm. and my second son Gideon. Those were the life changing moments for me, when I um, when I w- when my father passed away, and mm-hmm. I was sitting by his bed waiting for hours for his final breath and and it was it was magical it wasn't uh, it was it was a resting that i you know i'm not one of these hoo hoo people you know like ooh but there was an energy in that room and my aunt ida was there who died at 103 years later mm. but i thought my grandpa max who i'm named after his hebrew yiddish name was menachem mendel i swear i never met him cuz i'm named after him i was the first one born after he after he died and um, I thought it was in the room, and and the room was so charged, yeah. mm. and and so it it I just never experienced such electricity in a in a place, and it bonded my aunt Ida and me forever. 
So those were life-changing moments for me. Right. This was just a song. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am I am really interested, and I want to talk about some yeah. of the stuff the stuff you just mentioned in just a second. But I am I am really interested in how when you're a musician and when you're inspired by music, how it can affect the rest of your life. You know, I don't mm. talk about this too much. I'm a musician. And I do this job. Mm. I'm always thinking about what what does that do, right? Mm. And for someone like you, I just want to play another clip. Could we take a listen to the to the Homeland clip? Take a listen. Maybe I want other things. Like a terrorist in your bed. Maybe I don't want to be alone my whole life. Like me. Like you. Because it doesn't look that great, Saul. How does it feel? You don't know a damn thing. You're the smartest and the dumbest person I've ever known. You don't know a damn thing. That was my guest, Mandy Patinkin, as intelligence agent Saul Berenson in the TV series Homeland with his co-star Claire Danes. And I'm not doing an impression of you. I'm just trying to figure out what Claire is talking about when she said, Mandy is a really musical person. And he plays with that in the way he delivers the lines. Mm. What do you think that means? The way I learn music or words is I go over them hundreds and hundreds of times for hours and days and weeks. And I listen to them, and I ha- I had, they have no meaning initially. And little by little, I just start to literally, my mouth and everything starts, my body starts to memorize the word, the forming of them. And then I begin later to have thoughts with them. And then it's, way I, it's the way I rehearse and choose. And so then I'll have a thought that marries itself or connects it self, whatever the songwriter wrote or the or the script writer wrote, to something that I'm connected to in my life, visceral or in my imagination. Really? Or in my wishes or my dreams. And I and and my my game is to marry my imagina- my imaginative connective tissue thoughts to what the writers wrote that that's close enough so that it makes me alive mm. and it makes me connected. And so that's that's how I learned the music of it. And, and because of that, rehearsing and that repetition, as I begin to find out that idea, I don't like this one, I like, I'm going to keep holding it. Oh, that's a better idea. Or three days, oh, this is a better idea. Oh, I can't believe I didn't think of that idea. Oh, my God, that's what it is. And, you know, those are days and weeks later. And then I go in front of the camera, and the idea, because I've done all that homework, is now you can forget about it. My mm-hmm. wife always says when we talk to, you know, younger people, she, 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 you know, she, said, she gave the greatest note to me once. She said, Mandy, man, I said, I, I was ready to go out on an opening night of Secret Garden in, in New York and Broadway. And I said, I, I just, I'm just so nervous. I'm nervous. She says, Mandy, you know this guy. Just forget about it. Go out there. Listen to the words and see where they take you. And I think that is the most difficult thing to do. But you can do it if you're a workaholic or or a nervousaholic like Mm -hmm. me, meaning (laughs) I'll rehearse so much that I've gone through the possibilities, and therefore I then can say, okay, forget about it, and now be with you, who's my fellow actor, with that day, with what just happened in your life, my life, the world that day. And we say those words we've been rehearsing or doing for months, or in some cases years, which are called classical songs that you sing hundreds and hundreds of times. And so why today does it connect to you? Because you're listening to it. And because it's usually written so simply that it has a life that's endless. Right. But you can't do that if you're thinking about what it is. You can't do that if you're thinking about what's the next line. You no. Can't do it you and if you're worried, and, and if you have a head like mine, like, well, I don't want to miss the possibilities, like the last line that Lapine wrote in Sunday in the Park with George, I love so many possibilities. It, you, you know, so if you've rehearsed a lot, then at least you say to yourself, I've looked at the possibilities. If you're the president of a country, you can say to yourself, I've brought in the finest minds that I know in the world mm-hmm. to help me explore the possibilities. So when I make a decision, I know that I'm making the best decision that the finest minds can come up with. And and then you move forward. And even then you may make a mistake or miss something. But that's how life is. That, you don't, you know, that, a buddy of mine said, if you get up and you don't risk something every day, don't wake up. That's good advice. I want to play something else for you. Take a listen. Yeah. Your son is home, dad, and he's found a girl And she's the greatest girl in all the world I know where you're going I think you like that <laughs> You're on to me do. But if you don't, that's all right, too What's new 
Do you still work at the drugstore? Is that true? Still polishing the same floor I miss my good old dad My, but I'm glad to see you oh, It's my guest, Mandy Patinkin, singing the song by, in some ways, the greatest American songwriter, maybe, Randy Newman. So long, Dad, from his new record, Children in Art. We were talking earlier, and I, I referred to Evita as a life-changing moment for you, and you said, well, you know, it's not really. Life-changing moments are when I met my wife, when my kids were born, and when my father passed. I can't help but he must have thought, you must have been on your mind when you were singing that. This is a song where I'm with my dad, and bringing him back, and, and, uh, and making him be there forever. And I love this song. It's a beautiful one. I, I, um, I'm a bit moved by it, to be honest. I, I, I kind of went through something similar myself, you know? Yeah. And, they're, and you're kind of always hoping for an opportunity to dream about them, right? You're hoping yeah. that they oh, show I up, that right? you're saying that, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, sure, I know exactly what you mean. Wouldn't it be great if they showed up? <coughs> it would be, they do show up. As I said before, as long as there's one person on earth who remembers you, it isn't over. So you talk about them, they're there. I remember my dad died when I was 18. Oh, my God. Pancreatic cancer. And six years or so went by, and I hadn't had a dream. Then one day I had this dream. I was uh, playing a heart surgeon, and I was picked up by a real heart surgeon uh, in this movie, The Doctor, that uh, Bill Hurt and I did. And um, we were he was taking me to a sports event, and, and I just had this dream, and I said, I just had this dream about my father. I'd been waiting six years for this dream. And it was so real that I, you know, I literally went to this place like, who, who's going to prove to me that my dream is any less real than this conversation I'm having with you? Why can't that be just as real? Yeah, yeah. It was so vivid in my dream. But I, there was something else I wanted to tell you. Oh, I know what it was. I was doing a play, and I think the play was by Thomas Babe at New York Shakespeare Festival's Public Theater, Joe Papp, uh, the, the producer. It was called Rebel Women. And I went across the street to the Colonnades Cafe. And this is, I'm about, I hadn't met my wife yet, so I'm, I'm 21, two, three. And a guy walks up to me after the play, and I had this scene with Peter Weller where, you know, and it's a father-son play, but it was during the Civil War. And, and Peter and I had this scene together, and, and, and it's about loss. And, and a guy walks up to me, and I'm 20-something, 20 23, so, and a guy walks up to me who's in his 50s, and he says, uh, can I ask you? He says, I saw the play. I said, yeah. He said, can I ask you something? I, I, I said, sure. Did, did, did you, is your father alive? I said, no. How long ago did you lose your father? I said, I, I, about six years ago, and there was a pause, and I looked at this much older man. I said, is your father alive? No. Now, how long ago did you lose your father? Six days ago. And I said, wow. I said, you know, I, and I told him a story about this dream I had, and mm -hmm. I'd been waiting six years to have this dream, mm -hmm. and, and I felt so robbed because I was such a crazy kid, so manic and energetic and self-oriented and mm. didn't listen enough and didn't take time mm. and was robbed of the time with my dad. I was 18 and yeah. didn't get to know him the way I went. He said, let me tell you something. I'm 55. Mm. I just lost my dad. You feel that way when you're 55 or 65 or 75 or 85. 24. 24. I said, thank you. I said, so we do the best we can. That's good to know. I, 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 can't, I don't know how much I want to talk about this, but I have felt that way. I got, you know, oh, everyone else got more time. Yeah. 24. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. You can get 60 years. Yeah, but that's the gift of your imagination. And if you believe that... And see, my connection to God, yeah. and I'm not a, you know, I'm a spiritual guy, but I'm, I'm, science is my connection. So Einstein's theory of relativity, I get, meaning right. energy never dies. Back to what I said in the beginning when my dad died and that energy, that electricity in that room. So I believe that you can be 
in this space, the air you breathe, that it exists because that energy isn't what you and I are looking at or what we're listening to or the car or the radio or wherever you are. It is a different form, but that energy exists forever, just like light does and just like sound does. So therefore, if you want to breathe in Jesus or Buddha or Moses or your dad or my dad or anybody you knew, they're available. They're all around us. They're all around you. And that, that to me is science. Others will say that's religion. And I go, fine. I can't literally define either one of them, nor can I define love, which is everything religion, love, science, is everything I don't understand. I'm going to need to have some kind of nap after this interview, by the way. I'm going to need some kind of... Can we bring in a person? Are there still persons? Can we bring but when in some... you When you go through some of these singer-songwriter things, yeah. or, or, or guys like Steve Sondheim, or, even, or Irving Berlin, or, or, Randy or, or Oscar Hammerstein, Randy Newman, well, singer-songwriters yeah. and all those guys. Yeah. It, you know, these guys... Uh, I'm, I'm just the mailman. These guys are the geniuses. They are plugged into a kind of simplistic poetry that is so available and timeless. Yeah. It's undeniable. But like but like you said when it came to a role, what I find what I'm still kind of reeling from is that you you need to know the pieces so well and I'm taking it the same case with the music that you feel so attached to it with a personal experience or a thought or an emotion that even though you are the mailman, you're you're existing within the framework of which they wrote that music. You are also that music. My favorite word is connect. That's right. what the Pine wrote for Sunday in the Park with George. He had me say it over and over again, connect George, connect. If, if you're connected to the woman you meet, the man you meet, the child you have, the friend, your student, the world, you're alive. You're just alive. I always say, when, when I talk to people, when I, when I have the privilege of talking to a class, you know, and they ask me questions, I'm not a teacher, I just answer questions. And you yeah. put a nickel in me, I don't shut up. As, yeah. as, as, <laughs> this is evident. But, but uh, and I, I apologize to everyone listening. But, but, but I say to them, you know, well, well, what's a star? You know, what makes a star? The star definition of it in my mind is light. You know, and light, millions of light years, you know, it goes forever. Mm -hmm. But, but so, so this light. And so what does that mean? And, and, and what it means is something that you're witnessing that is alive. And that's the universal want. That's the universal get. I want to be alive like that star, like that lady I just had dinner with who I want to marry 40 years ago, like that guy I just met, like that song. I want to feel alive. And that's what's addictive. And that's why we go and look at that painting again or listen to that music of that composer again or that lyricist or go to that history class to hear that professor speak with a kind of life, life that I want to be alive like that professor is, that he gets excited. One day I went to Columbia, I went back to take American history, and one day I walked up to the professor and I said, are you okay? I thought, I thought he, like, he just got cancer or had a heart attack. He said, why? I said, you just seemed today in today's lecture like, like, you were, like something horrible happened. Oh, he said, I'm so sorry. I was hoping it wouldn't, it wouldn't show. I hate this particular, particular period of history, oh. and I can't wait till the lecture's over. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he didn't feel alive that day because he couldn't wait to get away from it. Can we play the last song? the last clip from nine psalm can you, can you play that for me and now I just want to be of you touch you be there for the ones I love to be of you my guest, Mandy Patinkin, singing To Be of Use from his new album, Children and Art. So we started by talking about, I asked you what music gave you as a child, and you told me the story of seeing these older, we'll say older men. Yes, yes, uh, men, fe fe men my age, <laughs> feeling, men younger than me now. Uh, feeling such deep emotions and reverence and, and, and tears and, and, and through the music. We talked a little bit about the power of, uh, of music, and, and you said that it's the best way to pray it's it's mm. this amazing way to, to pray music yeah. it, when you listen to something like that when you sing these songs now does it still feel like that to you yeah it's um it's a funny thing music i guess that's why shakespeare said of music be the food of love play on and it, it, and it's a universal language and 
and the, and it's the air going in and out of you if you're a singer, and you can't help but feel better than when you started, and it just recovers you, and it and 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 you know, I always like playing characters that have accents because it's easier to hide behind the accent. Therefore, it's like a mask, and therefore I'm freer mm. to express. Well, that's what music is because I'm not singing this interview to you. We're talking to each other on a pitch, granted, mm -hmm. but we're not singing, you know, literally. We can. We could, but, <laughs> but that singing yeah. is a step from reality, and that's a mask. Therefore, I find it freeing mm -hmm. to be truer to what you know and what you have no idea that's coming. I was doing a concert the other night, and I stopped and told the audience this story because a thought hit me. I'd sung this song for years, and you know, a certain song. And then it, something hit me right before the end, and I did this thing. And then I explained what it was that hit me and how it came about and why I did it. And that was after, I don't know how long I've done that song, 20-some years, this particular song. And uh, because I didn't think of something before. And, mm -hmm. and when it happens in front of an audience... That's, to me, what you live for. Yeah, that's the moment. That's what yeah. you're looking for. I mean, that, I think, is, you know, you, 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 know, you just, I mean, we're all coming to the theater, we're all, including me, to get away from it for a few minutes, mm -hmm. you know, and to go to something else that's a bit more comforting. That's one of the reasons I love doing these concerts more than anything in the world, is because these songs, these stories, these lyrics, they speak to me. And it's really comforting to feel that I'm not alone, mm -hmm. that other people like to listen to them along with me. And that's and so you don't feel alone. Well, that's that's what art can do. Art can, art can bring us back to our happiest moments. Art can make us feel better. It can give us, uh, it can illuminate our lives. I, I can't let you go without playing you the clip. Can we, can we play that for him? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. I'm happy you're smiling as I play that anyway. I was, <laughs> I was unsure how that was going to go. Oh, no, I love it. I can never get over when people bring it up that I got to be the guy in that movie. Nico Montoya from the, from the Princess Bride. Yeah. I just, uh, I love that people love that film, and I loved it. It was, a, I, and I just had the best time, and. Being with Andre all that time was beautiful. And, and people, I'm sure people come up to you all the time? Every day almost. Every day of my life. And I'm always stunned that I'm the guy, and I'm always thrilled that people love it, and generations. And uh, Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Because how many people do I talk to who are in your situation, who would, be, who would have a line like that or more likely a song like that, and they would go, oh, God, if someone brings it up to me one more time. Oh, I think they, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, we're here for five seconds, and if you, if you get lucky and, and something good happens to you in any area of this minuscule life, you know, enjoy it. And I say that to myself as much as I say it to anybody because my best friend, he stayed alive to say goodbye to my wife and myself, and he knew us. He knew we were nuts, and he, he lifted himself out of that bed, took that one spoonful of morphine, and he looked at us with wide eyes, and he said, the hardest thing in the world to do, have fun. I'm leaving it there. Manny Patinkin, nice to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Thank you.